Hey guys, Fixmo Revolution here and welcome to another video. This time I want to walk you through my latest and up-to-date guitar tone that I created for my upcoming album Ego Trip that's going to be released in summer 2017, I hope. And uh, well, first I want to show you the tone, how it sounds like in the final and polished mix here. I'm going to play it back with everything running, bass, drums, synth and so on. Then I'm gonna mute the synth because it messes a little bit with the guitar frequency wise. And then I'm gonna mute the bass so you can clearly hear uh, what the raw guitar tone is all about. Okay, so here we go. Now without the th uh, synth. And finally without the bass. So, as you can hear, I prefer a very raw, dirty, and a little bit genty guitar tone. And before I start mixing guitars, there are a couple of steps I always do to my mixes. Um, and that is related to my approach, how I approach my metal mixes. And uh, I have a top-down mixing approach. So basically what that means is I start mixing on the master bus and I make my way uh, down the buses. Um, if you are not familiar with top-down mixing and what it means, like mixing in a limiter and having an SSL bus compressor on the instrument bus and so on, if all that is new to you, what I show you right now, um, I strongly recommend you to view my video about my approach to a metal mix. I have a separate, uh, nearly two hour long video where I uh, explain in detail how I start mixing a metal mix. That is very important to know. And like I said, I strongly recommend you to watch that video and then come back here if you don't know what top-down mixing means and is. So for the track layout here first, um, like I said, mastering, I always mix into um, a stealth limiter. That's this guy here to make the mix loud, uh, to control the transients of the snare and kick in the end and not run into problems later in the mastering stage. This is something that's very common uh, in top-down mixing. I'm gonna disable the saturator and the multiband compressor and the EQ on the master channel right now because those three plugins I usually add when I'm done mixing the guitars. So I wanna be realistic here, I don't wanna cheat on you and have those plugins enabled while I'm mixing guitars. That would be unfair, kind of, um, because the limiter is the only plugin on the master channel that I have activated while mixing guitars. Now, um, then my all my instruments, uh, the synths, if I have any in the song, the guitars, the bass, and the drums are summed up in the instruments bus. This is very important um, because I run two equalizers um, and an SSL bus compressor on this instrument bus. Those are also added before I start mixing anything. Those are added before I start mixing drums, bass, guitars. Um, this is all covered in the video I just said. I put the link in the video description down here. Uh, go check that out if you want to know more about that. This uh, should not be part of this video right now. So I just want to 
make clear that I have the limiter, two EQs, and an SSL bus compressor and instrument bus running when I start mixing guitars. Okay, so let's take a look at the layout of the tracks under the guitar bus. I sum up all my guitars like a lead and rhythm guitars under a guitar bus. I'm not doing that much on the guitar bus, actually. I'm going to come to that plugin in, in a minute. Now, um, the lead guitar in this song is a gimmick. It's an effect. I don't want to talk about that. Um, that makes no sense. It's just a little bit of a picking and banding thing. Not worth men mentioning. I'm going to mute that. So what I want to talk about is the rhythm guitars, what you heard a second ago. This rhythm uh, rhythm guitar bus has another sub bus called DI, or maybe I should <laughs> maybe I should uh, name that differently. Let's call it raw tone because it's not the DI. If we take a look at the mixer here, see I got a left channel and a right channel, so I'm not um, quad recording my guitars or anything. I record my guitars twice for the rhythm and pan them hard left and hard right. That is a very common thing to do. Some people prefer quad tracking. I don't like that um, because um, the effect that you usually get when quad tracking your guitars and mixing them probably, you got this little bit of phasey sound going on. Um, even if, if, if the tracks are phase aligned, you still have this phasey sounding touch to it. And that is something I don't like. As I said before, I like that raw, dirty, defined guitar tone. That is what I'm aiming for. And that is what I do here with two tracks instead of four. Cool. So these two left and right are summed up in this raw tone uh, channel right here. So I got treatment on every single channel. Now, a lot of people ask me this, why don't you use uh, a single channel in stereo and put every plugin in stereo mode like compressors and EQs? And um, I'm going to explain to you why I don't do that. Um, I mean, <laughs> uh, a quick explanation, but I, I use different e equalizers on each channel. Uh, if that makes sense. But the real reason why you shouldn't do uh, this is compression. Because it's left and it's right. And even if you use the same amp simulation and cabinets on your tone, even then, it's a different take. It's a different instrument. It's, it's something different. It's not the same. The same would be if you copy the track, but that sounds shitty, as we all know. But it's a different instrument and treat it as its own. <laughs> Respect the guitar tracks uh, as their own. And um, I'm not, I'm not going to cover this right now, but compression is, an, is a serious issue that you'll encounter if you put those two tracks into stereo mode and only use uh, a single chain of effects. So, like I said, I come to that later. So, uh, the raw tone is the sum of left and right. And this ch channel is basically for the stereo processing. Like, if I have additional EQs to do that are uh, that I want to apply to both channels, left and right, I do that on this channel right here. And then I have a room send. I don't like entirely dry guitars. I like dry guitars, but not entirely dry like fart guitars, okay? I like a little bit of room room touch to it, like a room microphone. Um, digital amp simulation plugins usually lack that. Uh, you don't have that room fill. Like if you put a put a real cabinet with an amp into a room and you mic that cabinet, you record a lot of that room sound, how that cabinet sounds in that specific room. And that's something digital plugins lack a lot. 
There are some plugins that provide you with uh, additional room microphones, but some don't. And I have my own reverb plugin that I really like on guitar tones, and this is what I'm using right here. So the raw tone track gets sent to the room bus and the room and raw tone uh, gets some, summed up under the rhythm, okay? Uh, the rhythm track is just for, well, for uh, visual represent representation or, or organization, because you see on the rhythm track, I have actually no plugins whatsoever. Cool. Now, let's start mixing. I'm gonna deactivate everything here. I'm gonna uh, deactivate the room. Guitar Bus has a plugin. Like I said, I don't wanna care about the lead guitar here. I'm gonna disable this, 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 this. Good. And I'm gonna mute the room channel. So, I do DI recording. Uh, that means I plug my guitar straight into the audio interface. If you ask me what audio interface I use, uh, you'll be surprised. I use a Behringer UMC 404 HD. That's a four channel audio interface from Behringer. It costs about 111 bucks. And punch me in the face for this. Uh, I like it way more than my previous Focusrite uh, 2i2 interface. It sounds cleaner. It gets the job done. It never failed me. And the, the drivers are actually a lot faster compared to the Focusrite audio interface. I'm much happy, happier with the Behringer audio interface. I just, I just said to me like, ah, come on, a hundred bucks for audio interface, four channel. I I'm gonna return it if it's shit and I kept it. And to be honest, I own four of these things at the moment and they are amazing. I, I, cannot, I, <laughs> I cannot do anything. I like those things. So if you think uh, your tone gets a lot better with an, I don't know, with a Motu or Focusrite audio interface, I don't think so. At least when DI recording, okay? So to hear anything, because at the moment my guitar sounds something like this. Uh, sorry, if I disable uh, everything. Well, that's my DI. Uh, that is, by the way, a Jackson guitar with Samer Duncan Nazgul 7 uh, in bridge position. I don't use the neck position, humbucker. And it's drop A, tuned to A, E, A. Good. To hear anything, I'm going to introduce some stomp boxes, the amp, and a cab. Let's go through this. Amp first. Uh, on both sides, I use an angle powerball simulation from IK Multimedia. On the second channel, lead channel actually, the open setting and low gain, I think that is. I don't have activated those two buttons here. And well, don't try to match those settings. They won't work for you. I know you guys, you wanna, you wanna uh, take a brief peek in here and you want to copy the guitar tone maybe. Um, stop doing that. Because you have a different audio interface, you have different guitar, you have different humbuckers, and most importantly, maybe you record at a total different gain setting. And by copying my settings, you don't do yourself any good. Try not to find out on YouTube how you do things, but why you do things, okay? Try to follow the workflows that audio engineers do and try to learn from this and build up experience why you do things. Why do I, uh, why do I treat the gain knob in a certain way with a distortion pedal in front of it? Why do I uh, raise the mid knob like crazy? Why do it? Not how. The how is easy take the knob and, and put it like to 11 of 10, that's easy, but 
do you know why you do that? That's the more important part. So, uh, angle powerball, like I said, you see me not using that much presence and travel. That has to do with my top-down approach because on my instrument bus, I actually boost a lot of high end due to my uh, overall balance of the of the song. That is a decision I make before I start mixing the instruments individually. That's part of the other video, by the way, again. So we got the, uh, the Powerball on each side. Same settings. The amp has the same settings. And in front of the amp, I have Pandora's box and a noise gate. So noise gate is very fast. It has, I think, how fast is that? 0 0.1 milliseconds, 100 nanoseconds gate attack and five milliseconds of fade. Th uh, three shoal is around, yeah, f minus 46 dB. It's quite, quite low. And Pandora's box is a very nice box from uh, TSC Audio. This is the TSC X50 plugin, by the way. I, I uh, named it Pandora here because I, I'm only using the stomp box section of this plugin. Uh, I know a lot of people like the 808, the uh, overdrive pedal, originally from Maxon. And Ivanis did that too. But Pandora's box is a lot more aggressive to the tone. We can compare that actually. Uh, let's do that in a minute. I'll show you the differences between the Pandora's box and the TSC 808. That's a very nice thing to know what that does to the sound. Now, cabinet, I use Three Sigma Audio's Angle 4x12 cabinet. And I only use one. The, uh, the right side here is not enabled, as you can see. So I use the Angle 3A on the left channel. And I use the Angle 3B on the right channel. What does A and B mean? A. Uh, the impulse response for A was created with a modded PV5150 and uh, with a tube stage and the B version of it was recorded with this flat solid state amp. And uh, the audible difference between those two is that A has a little bit more low end rumble. It's a little bit more present in the low end and B is a little bit more present in the high end. And I don't, I, I like that little diversity between the left and the right channel because often I write songs where you hear uh, panned guitars where only the left guitar plays alone and uh, in another part of the song only the right guitar plays alone. And I like if the left guitar and the right guitar don't sound the same. They still use the same amp, but due to the different cabinets and due to the different um, the different preamps that were used to create the impulse response, you get that little difference. You you feel like the left channel has a little bit more oomph in it, and the right channel is a li little bit more pristine in the high end. So that's why I uh, make that decision here. Left channel the A version, right channel, the B version. Uh, let's take a listen how that sounds right now. So that is my basic starting point that I work with. The humbuckers are very, very clean. They produce very, very high output. So my humbuckers, the, the Seymour Duncan Neskul 7, uh, make a huge impact or have a huge impact on my tone. So if you come up with like shitty EMG 81s, active humbuckers, you probably won't achieve that crisp and clean fundamental tone that you just heard. Now, for you guys loving the TSC 808, 
I'm not I'm not telling TSC808 as a is a bad plugin. No, it it can be used on various metal mixes. It's an amazing overdrive pedal, but I quickly want to compare that to uh to the Pandora's box. So I'm going to add real quick the 808 that is, by the way, available as a as a, a standalone plugin from TSZ. It's the same version, same algorithm. And usually, what people do is drive zero tone volume, right? That's the TSZ eight hundred eight setting everyone uses. Comparison, Pandora's box. So the Pandora's box is more aggressive. Not much, but it has not that uh, that much of bass response, and it, it sounds just a little bit more scratchy. The pick attack is 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 more there, more present. So that's the difference between the TSC-808 and Pandora's box. TSC-808, not bad at all. You could use that anytime, but I personally prefer the Pandora's box. So let's get rid of those two again. And uh, setting-wise, I use a little bit of drive and uh, I boost the high end extremely. I like that. That is like the tone knob in the TSC. And the great thing is that the Pandora's box has the option to treat the low and high end differently. And as you can see here, I pull down the low end response a little bit. Okay. Cool. That's it. By the way, output setting, uh, just make sure that you don't clip. Basic. High output, but don't clip. Now, that's a basic tone. What do I do next? Usually, I start messing around with the EQ between the amp and the cap. This is something very nice. Uh, you cannot do that in real life. You cannot go ahead and EQ the signal between your amp, your tube head, and your cabinet, because that's a 120 watt signal. I think uh, if you plugged in a hardware EQ there, that thing would catch fire and burn down. So this is something uh, you have really an advantage in digital audio <laughs> recording here because uh, I can just implement uh, an EQ between the amp and the cabinet. What do I do here? I have a low cut at 80 hertz and a high cut at 10,000 hertz. What I'm doing here is the following. If you listen, to the tone without the EQs. You'll encounter this guitar tone has too much low end. There's a lot of low end rumble around 100 hertz going on. We can actually see that if I choose to add an, an EQ plugin to see the, uh, the, oh my God, how it's called. The spectrum. Ah, saved, saved, saved. The spectrum of the guitar. Let's take a look at this. You see this? That is what I mean. That is uh, some low end response that is usually unnecessary and I don't want to go ahead and low cut this at this early stage of the guitar tone. A low cut is for me a final polishing tool that I use on the entire guitar bus. Like you can see here, that is a later step. I don't want to introduce that on the single channels right here. But to work towards that, I introduce a low cut and a high cut between the amp and the caps. Because if you strip away frequencies before the audio signal hits the cabinet, 
it makes the cabinet impulse respond differently to the input signal. So um, probably could do that also with the real cabinet. Uh, I, I don't know if that would work, but logically, I'm a software developer, I think logically. Logically, if you don't provide certain frequencies to a cabinet, the cabinet will treat all the other frequencies differently compared when all other frequencies were there. And that is exactly what I try to achieve here. So I'm not feeding my cabinet anything below 80 hertz and above 10,000 hertz. And we can listen to that. That is a very subtle difference, but it's there. Check that out. Disabled, and I'm gonna enable those two plugins while playing. Very subtle, very subtle. Maybe we can listen to it uh, if I center one guitar. Maybe, and it's more obvious what it does. I think you need very good headphones or uh, monitors to hear that. But it's very subtle, but it it works towards a better tone, definitely. So I like that approach. Good. Next in line, after the cabinet, is basic EQing. That is what everyone does. Filtering out the fizz and uh, s looking for frequencies that you want to have. Cut those frequencies out that you don't want to have additive and subtractive EQ. Now, here's another story why I like to treat my left and right channel differently, because as you can see, those equal, uh, equalizers are not the same. Now, why aren't they? Because I use different cabinet impulses on my guitar tones. The left channel uses that A version of the angle with a lot more bass response. And the B version on the right channel has more high frequency response. That all ends up, for example, with a different treatment of the bass frequencies. As I said, the A version needs a little bit more treatment of uh, the frequency at, what is that, 145 hertz. That's really problematic, like I showed you before, that low end rumble that's going on. And the B version of the angle cabinet doesn't have that much rumble going in, so I don't need to strip away that much to get a decent result. So, uh, let's check that out. I'm gonna mute or bypass the, those equalizers first, and I'm gonna punch them in. <laughs> That is quite a huge difference. You hear all that low end rumble? Now it's much cleaner. I know, uh, I know a lot of people ask me, how do I find those frequencies that are annoying? How do I find those? And I want to show you real quick. I never did that in a video, I guess. And uh, a lot of people ask me that. So let's center the guitars right now, or the left guitar right now and solo it. Now let's go hunting for uh, awkward frequencies. How do I do that? I grab an equalizer plugin. You don't necessarily need to uh, have a fab filter, but that's my go-to EQ because it's very transparent. Now I'll play back my guitar tone and I sweep, I grab a fre frequency band and a bell, please. 
and I make that very, very shallow. And now what you can do is you can sweep through the frequency range and you probably will encounter a position where your ears start to explode or you will start to cry because it sounds so bad. And that's probably when you hit a frequency that's messing with your tone. Let's do that. That will be a candidate. So what you do, what you want to do if you found such a frequency is you want to pull that down. Listen to the difference. It is like vacuum cleaning your frequency range. It's like taking a vacuum cleaner and go over the frequency range. And here's a tip, don't overdo it. Um, there's a high temptation that you go over the frequency range and you end up with like 12 or 13 of these bumps. That is probably not what you want to do. You want to grab, I, I, I'd say the four or five most important ones and treat them accordingly. Always listen to your overall tone with everything playing to judge if you uh, did a right or wrong move, okay? Don't overdo it with these subtractions. Okay, so that's equalizer. Left and right, uh, right channel treated very differently. You can see here, not only this band, but that is a little bit wider on this right channel here. It didn't decrease that band that much. There's a little bit more high end going on. It, it, is, it is a very visual representation of the cabinet. This cabinet has a lot more high end going on because so that the higher frequencies are a little bit more problematic on this side, on the right side and the lower uh, response frequencies are a little bit more problematic on the left side here. And that is represented by the equalizers real nice here. Next in line is a multiband compressor, but I don't use these multiband compressors actually as a, as a compression tool. Ah, kind of, kind of. It's more like an equalizer. So, what I want to achieve, these two bands actually achieve different things. I have to explain that. The first band here between 65 hertz and 255 hertz has one specific uh, job to do, and that is evening out palm mutes. If you don't know that, strumming a note and palm muting a note is volume wise very different palm mutes have a lot more energy to it or a lot more energy in the in the audio signal so they are louder basically and what i want to achieve here is so that my open strings are equally loud compared to my uh my palm mutes and i achieve that with compressing the low end of the palm mutes whenever they exceed a certain value. So what I do with this band is I compress my palm mutes and I don't compress my open strings. How do I do that? Well, I go check my song for any part where I have open strings and mutes. Let's see. Mm. Yeah, 
let's use this. Okay, here's a good example. So here we have some strumming, and look what the what the bass range here does, or what the multiband compressor band here does when uh, strumming is played. It basically does nothing. But if there are mutes, suddenly this band starts working. And this is just for evening out the bass levels so that my mutes don't uh, stand out in my overall mix. The upper band here is a little bit of an EQ thing. I want to control the high frequencies of the guitar tone not to stand out extremely. In this band, there's a lot of fizz located. It's between uh, uh, 1 kilohertz and 7 kilohertz. And what the difference between a multiband compressor and an equalizer is in this case, if you pull down that band with an equalizer, you're subtracting these frequencies always from the entire sound. So you're subtracting that EQ band always. It doesn't matter what is getting played. Um, if you're strumming, open strings, muting, it doesn't matter what and how you play, those frequencies are always subtracted from your sound. If you use a multiband compressor for this purpose, you can pull this down, but a multiband compressor or a compressor in general, general will only subtract those frequencies from the sound if the frequencies are there. And that's the main and largest difference between using an EQ and a multiband compressor. So think about that. Um, you can do EQing with multiband compression in a much more uh, in a much more specific way. If you want to cut out frequencies always, take an EQ. If you want to cut out frequencies only if these frequencies are there specifically, use a multiband compressor like I did here. Let's make a, an A-B a, test here real quick. I'm gonna stereo this again. Deactivate those. Uh, let's take that loop. That's not doing much. So like I said, if I disable those multiband uh, this those multiband compressors, the high end uh, is a little bit more open. It's a little bit more fizzy. I didn't like that. That's why this band is there. And like I said, this for the mutes. Good. Next step is compression of every channel here. I use the C2 from Fat Filter, and I don't do much here. I just want to control the dynamic range of the guitars a little bit. Um, that doesn't change the sound actually, but I just want to further make sure that the guitar volume is locked into place a little bit more. That's the purpose of it. And you can actually see that on the visual representation of the gain reduction right here. If I play that back. So it evens out those slight bumps. It evens out the attack of the tone a little bit, but there's not much going on here actually. So cool. That is my treatment of the single channels. And I wanna make a quick comparison between uh, all those plugins or those uh, equalizers enabled and disabled. So you can see what happened there already. So this is only amp cap and distortion pedal, our basic tone. I want it to hear everything, please. Cool. 
And now all the treatment are enabled. We have very subtle changes. It's the basic tone doesn't change that much. Even though we EQ'd a lot here. But the feel is exactly the same. All we did is we cleaned up the frequency range so it sounds more transparent, more into the mix, more focused. And we uh, treated our volume, our dynamic range. So the guitar tone is not all over the place dynamic wise. Cool. Now we can go ahead and take a look at the at our um, bus, our raw tone bus. So this is the stereo bus where our left and right DI signals or amp signals meet. The first thing I do usually is EQing. This is a multiband compressor. It's the same thing like before. Now I want to treat the overall guitar tone. Um, everything I do, EQ, I did EQ wise and multi compression and compression wise on the on the single tracks here was specifically aimed towards that single tone. Now I'm gonna treat the left and right channel simultaneously according to my surroundings like bass and drums and how the guitar contributes to the music. And by the way, you always want to do this by A being um, with soloed guitars and the whole mix. You need to listen to the mix while adjusting those equalizers because uh, listening to your guitar tone and pu pulling around those little knobs and, and, and bubbles, that doesn't help you if you don't know and check what the impact of this move exactly is uh, regarding your overall tone. That's very important. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what we did here. I'm gonna solo that so we can hear it clearly. Disable. Okay, so what did I do here? And more importantly, how did I come to these decisions? So basically what we can say is I removed a lot of the high end of the tone. It was just too much. It sounded a little bit fizzy. And I boosted the mid range here because I like that mid range punch in my mixes. And I realized that, let's disable it again and play back the track that the guitar sounds very, uh, in my opinion, a little bit too thin in the top end, and there could be more body to it. Let's play that back. So if I enable this plugin, for me the guitar moves a little bit further into the mix. It blends better with the bass and the drum kit, in my opinion. That is the reason why I introduced this. So why no EQ? Because I want to treat the frequency on frequencies only when they occur. This is a lot more, ah, a lot more controllable in comparison with the EQ. I like EQing with multiband compressors, to be honest. That gives me way more control than an equalizer. 
Next in line is a basic saturator. This is a kind of a big deal. I love the Saturator X from IK Multimedia in the class A position here for uh, distorted guitars. This plugin is phenomenal and you can drive the shit out of it and it still sounds good. This adds a lot of warmth and oomph to the tone. That is basically what makes your guitar tone fat. Really fat. Let's punch it in. Let's solo this without. So this not only raises the volume perhaps a little bit, um, but it adds this mid punch, that clarity to it. I like that plugin a lot. And by the way, I all, uh, always use this plugin on the master channel later. That is just a plugin I, I could actually throw on any track in the, <laughs> in the project, if I'm honest. Sounds so good. Then next in line is a little bit of quad imaging here, stereo imaging. As you can see, I let the frequencies up to 150 uh, alone, and then I widen my tone in the stereo image just a little bit. It's really not much. You don't overdo it with stereo imaging. You can very quickly destroy your overall guitar tone. It gets phasey and fizzy, and it sounds weird if you overdo it, but a tiny little bit just spreads the guitars uh, and it makes the the mix feel kind of more open but not much this is a step you don't necessarily have to do this is just a taste thing i like it maybe you don't like it if you don't like it just throw throw out the plugin no problem so let's check that yeah, just a tiny little bit wider. Not much indeed. Now, uh, before we take a look at the room, I like to introduce the most important plugin of the guitar chain, and that is the low cut filter. What you don't want to have in your metal songs is the guitar playing the bass. I have seen a lot of mixes or heard a lot of mixes where if you turned off the bass, if you muted the bass and you just listened to the guitars and the drum kit, the mix was still very bass heavy and fat. And that should not happen. Because why do you have a bass then? Duh. And this is where the slow cut filter comes in. If I don't do that, we have this. And you actually see all those sub 100 frequencies here. And if I enable it, there's suddenly gone.
Okay, this seems to be like a natural thing, but actually I want to show you what should happen if you mute the bass in your mix. Usually, if you mute a bass in a mix, your mix should fall apart completely. And that is basically what we're aiming for. This is not a bad thing. So let's do it right now. Okay. That's the thing. You can actually hear the bass playing. I hate metal mixes where the guitar is all over the place and I actually cannot hear what the bass is doing, what the bass is playing. Is he is he playing with fingers? Is he playing with a pick? If I cannot distinguish between those things, then I really don't like it. I want to hear the bass playing and that is especially important if you have for example, like in this song, a part where the bass is simply playing alone and the guitar punches in at a certain point in time, like here. Sorry. Uh, here. So basically what you're aiming for, your guitar does not necessarily add in more low end to the mix. That is what we're aiming for. On the other side, if we go ahead and mute our guitars, your overall mix should not lose any of the punch in the low end. That is the opposite, like this. The punch is still there without the guitars. Okay. Enough of that topic. Now polish the guitar tone. Room. Not everybody likes it. No, not everybody does it. I like it. That's why I do it. I send my guitar tone, my stereo tone here, to a room reverb channel. Let's unmute this. And on this channel, there's a room plugin from the CSR bundle uh, of uh, the classic studio room reverbs of IK Multimedia. I like this. It's a very short reverb, 0.12 of a second, 120 milliseconds. And it's a, it's a classic room reverb. And you see the mix knob uh, is at 100% because uh, we have the dry signal here on this channel and we only want to have the room reverb on this channel. And what I actually do here is I low cut the reverb. I don't low cut the guitars again, but I low, low cut the reverb at 130 hertz to not introduce more low end rumble uh, than there already is. I'm going to show you the room here. What that sounds like. So you get this kind of bathroom feeling. And if you blend that into your, your dry guitar tone, something really cool happens here. I'm going to pull down that fader. And now I'm going to raise this up and listen to the guitars what happens here. Sure, that's too much. So I was at minus five. If I mute that, uh, that was the rhythm.
And suddenly your guitar comes to life. That is a very important thing for me. And that is what uh, the majority of digital amp simulations lack. You have to manually add that room feeling, that that life to your to your amps again, manually, uh, uh, so to say. So, okay, I think that is it for the guitar tone, actually. I do not, I, I don't do much more treatment to guitars. That's it. That's all it. Let's unmute, unmute the, the lead. And basically that's my, well, my finished guitar tone. cool so i hope that makes sense for you i hope you maybe learn something from that maybe uh that offers you a new approach to your tone maybe something you didn't see maybe and uh please let me know what you think about that what did you like about that tone or that approach tell me what you didn't like do you have any additions to that what you where you are like, okay, um, you do that, but try that and maybe it gets even better. Let me know. I'm always interested in a very nice discussion, but keep the comment section clean, please. I got a lot of trolls lately hanging around on my channel. Uh, I don't like that very much. Be nice in the comment section and thank you for watching. It's much appreciated. Have a good time. Bye.